Welcome and thank you for attending this session on how to think about and bring gender diversity to the biology classroom. I am Sam Long, my pronouns are he, him. My name is Louis Steller, I also use the pronouns he and him. My name is River Sa, I use the pronouns they and he. As biology teachers, we get to hear what the future is curious about, right in our own classroom. You may have had students who ask, is it natural to be gay? How can someone have two moms and no dad? Or maybe they've heard some more about genes and ask, if men are XY and women are XX, then what about trans people? The goal of genderinclusivebiology.com is to create and curate free engaging resources for diverse gender, sex, and sexuality in a scientifically accurate and accessible way. Any teaching about gender and sex requires foundational knowledge. Um, we're going to provide you with two graphical models that can lay that foundation for your students, as well as define some of the words that we'll be using during this presentation. This is the Gender Unicorn. It's created by um, the Trans Student Education Resources, um, and it can be a really great way to parse apart some of the main aspects of identity that can sometimes come up, um, both in the biology classroom and in teaching in general. I'm talking about gender identity and expression, sex assigned at birth, um, and physical and emotional attraction. We also have this awesome uh, resource put out by GLSEN that talks specifically about gender terms, thinking about the differences between sex assigned at birth, gender expression, how that's displayed, gender identity, how one sees oneself, um, and gender attribution, how other people perceive you out in the world. Four key terms we're gonna use today. One is gender identity, a personal sense of one's own gender, which is self-determined and distinct from sex assigned at birth. Uh, we may also touch on sexual orientation, which is uh, distinct from gender identity, just about attraction towards men, women, both another gender or neither. Um, and then these two words we will use a lot. One is transgender, which is broadly anybody who does not fully identify with the gender assigned to them at birth, um, and gender inclusive. And our goal is to create a curriculum that acknowledges and affirms all identities, including transgender, non-binary, cisgender, and intersex identities. And as teachers, we can do a lot to help make our spaces a lot safer for all of our students. Studies have shown that an inclusive curriculum helps by decreasing victimization, decreasing anti-LGBT remarks, and most critically, decreasing absenteeism because a student doesn't feel safe. It also creates an increase in positive relationships with teachers and notably creates an increase in peer support intervention against anti-LGBT remarks. The NABT actually has a position statement on equity in science education that gets at some of these ideas. The statement says that we need to reflect the full spectrum of human dimensions in our teaching and that diversity contributes to the richness of biological science. The NSDA has a more recent and also very good statement on gender equity where they specifically call out that gender equity is not just boys and girls, it's about students of any sex, gender identity and or expression or sexual orientation. It also calls out the fact that when teaching about reproduction or evolution, we may unwittingly marginalize students who don't identify with these um, heterosexual roles if we teach that exclusively. And we may miss important opportunities to explore the diversity of reproductive strategies among living things and the growing evidence of non-binary nature of sex in humans. Our NGSS standards also call this out in Appendix D, All Standards, All Students. It says that we need to understand the context that influences science learning by diverse student groups, and that teachers need to have effective strategies to include all students, regardless of, among other things, gender backgrounds. So how does this all translate into an updated language and different models in the classroom? Some teachers may find this impossible or even risky for their school site or position. So we trust that every teacher knows their own audience. And we wrote a few articles to help guide you, whether you're ready to talk about progesterone with your principal, or if you're still pointing out that there are many ways to be a cis woman. And on the screen, you can see that one table and a zoom in of the infographic that shows you different ways that you can adapt your language to be a lot more inclusive, especially when some students have family members that may not match what's in your textbook. Here's one example of adapting language towards inclusion and precision. Here's a typical diagram that we've all used for meiosis. People with ovaries, also labeled typically women, are producing eggs. People with testes, typically men, producing sperm. Um, this is 
different in a small but important way from diagrams that show a figure of a stereotypical man and woman in place here. Here we're emphasizing what's important. It's about meiosis. It's not about a person's presentation. It's about whether they have ovaries, which are pictured here, or testes. And so this is modified from a pre-existing document. And this is certainly not the be-all end-all of language for meiosis, but it's an example of the way that we can adapt existing language. Another small tweak we can use to bring equity and gender into our science classrooms is think about etymology. Science makes no sense until you start to decode those root words that give science meaning. And so here are four from a set of etymology posters. These root words ad, vi, dis, and an, or a, all have examples related to science and related to equity and LGBTQ identity. Uh, students love to see the way that the words they use in everyday life relate to social issues as well as STEM issues. This next part of the presentation is going to be focused on this framework for gender inclusive biology education, which is something that uh, we encourage teachers to be reflecting on and thinking about as they teach biology uh, and trying to use a more gender inclusive lens. Now, there's a lot of text here. We're not gonna dig into this. Um, we will drop into the chat a link to a, um, an article that goes more in depth into each aspect of this uh, particular framework. But here we kind of have narrowed down each aspect of this uh, framework into a particular guiding question as you are uh, doing reflection on your practice. Um, for authenticity, uh, are you creating a curriculum that is accurate or is there some oversimplification that is making it actually harder to create a inclusive lens through the lens of diversity? Um, through continuity, uh, is the lens that's being used consistently inclusive or are there special token lessons that are the days when gender is talked about? Um, because we find that students really respond well to that lens being uh, consistent throughout the curriculum. With affirmation, uh, is diversity and gender topics, are they normalized or are they stigmatized? And there's a lot of ways that science historically has stigmatized diversity in both sex and gender. And so finding ways to normalize that diversity and point out the ways that it is completely natural. Um, an anti-oppression lens, are we empowering groups that are traditionally marginalized or are we continuing that marginalization in the way that we frame them in our classrooms? And then finally, student agency. Are we inviting uh, students sharing their experiences? Are we creating spaces for students to feel safe? Um, are we also inviting them into the process of creating that science itself? So we're gonna go through um, examples from things that we have observed or the things that we recommend that kind of link up to each of these parts of the framework. So our first example is thinking about authenticity. So authenticity asks us to reflect on our own knowledge and comfort level with the topic, um, to think about some modifications of the curriculum, which could be big or small ways, um, with urgency, but at your own pace. Uh, and really thinking about making intentional changes and embedding them into the lesson, not into the footnotes. So you see here, there's an example of a diagram that shows a particular um, stereotype of an individual, and it says chromosome from father, chromosome from mother. Because of the many different ways that families are made and the ways that humans are made, um, one small change that we could make is just um, eliminating that particular aspect of the language. That's one small step. Um, and there's a lot of suggestions in the article that River alluded to earlier. Um, but I would also just say that the first step in authenticity can be acknowledging our own limits in what we know and the limits of the resources we use. As teachers, we're very busy. And so even just starting from a place of, hey, I know that this isn't perfect, let's explore it together can have a huge impact on students. And there's also a great opportunity to build better, more meaningful learning relationships with your students if you include authentically this lens throughout all of your curriculum. Continuity helps not only include more students, but also reduces the cognitive load to make learning a lot easier. And it's a lot simpler to build up new ideas instead of revising an imprecise shortcut. I know my own students have asked the obvious, why tell us there's only XX and XY when I have a friend right next to me with a fairly naturally occurring karyotype, like non-disjunction or disjunction. So instead of reaching for exclusion and imprecision, we can instead lean into the freedom that diversity offers us. When we open up the space to any number of different ideas and discoveries that we're not even used to, I think it makes learning far more accessible and affirming for all students. 
And this game here from Matt Gilbert and Sarah Freeman just shows the naturally occurring disjunction and non-disjunction combinations that can result in more than just XX and XY karyotypes. Third part of the framework, affirmation, means teaching the naturally occurring diversity of gender and sexuality in both human and non-human species. These are not aberrations or anomalies. Diversity is a part of biology. It's all of biology, really. And so diverse identities, behaviors, and anatomy can be considered fit in the context of evolution. They can be considered successful, and often they're the most interesting to learn about. It's not going to do students any good to look at four different examples of animals in which the males are larger or flashier. That's not going to help them understand the diversity of the world. Why do that when you can also learn about gay swan couples that are successfully raising their young more often than straight swan couples? And we're using gay and straight here as shorthand for um, homosexual and heterosexual pairings. Similarly, Students love to learn about hyenas and how female hyenas have functional penises. And in this case, it challenges what they've learned, those generalizations that they've perhaps learned in the past about anatomy and sex and gender. We need to celebrate diversity as a valuable asset for thriving and surviving, both in societies and among scientists. It's not to say that um, we're supposed to compare our students to gay swans to gay students, but to show that this diversity is naturally occurring. It's not only humans, and it's a part of our understanding of biology. Anti-oppression is an important but very difficult aspect of the gender inclusive biology framework. We need to practice using science explanations and data to analyze and challenge the status quo. For example, this X-linked recessive uh, inheritance chart. What messages are present here? The way that the silhouettes of the mother and father, as they're called, and the daughters and sons are given here. We need to examine how science can be used as a tool to fight oppression. What's the difference between a biological family, like one might see in a Punnett Square, and social concepts of family? This poster from the Gaby Baby Project shows there's more than one way to make a family, and we need to make sure our students understand the difference between a family in the sense of DNA or genetics and a family that they know at home and that they know from their friends' homes. Similarly, the way that we think about hormones working in the body, so often hormones are taught in a way of here's the female system, here's the male system. These systems have commonalities though, and that's that the hypothalamus begins by producing GnRH, stimulating the pituitary to release two other hormones, LH and FSH, which stimulate the gonads, whether they're ovaries or testes. If we want to understand this fully, we need to understand the way that exogenous drugs can affect the system. And so we look at luprolide or Lupron, a drug which blocks the pituitary receptors for GnRH and thereby prevent stimulation to the gonad, whether it's ovaries or testes. This is a rigorous example of feedback systems in the human body, but it also is an example of the way that science can be involved in anti-oppression. Luprolide is a drug originally made for children going through precocious puberty, but today it's more often than not used for young children who don't want to go through puberty that are expressing that they may be transgender. And this makes a huge difference in their lives, the ability to stop the puberty that would occur for them. The price of this drug, um, several hundred dollars per dose that lasts one month. What does that say about the way that we provide medical treatment to young people? The last aspect of the framework that I'll be touching on, uh, it's one of my favorites, is really thinking about student agency. So within the student agency framework, um, it's really important for us to remember that each group of students that we work with has um, specific needs or particular things that, in a classroom culture, that you are co-creating with them. This is not a one-size-fits-all uh, curriculum. It's going to be something you have to work on as a community. Um, and so it's important to know your students and to plan lessons that are super relevant to their experiences. 
to offer students choices for research projects and case studies, and to use student created language when no precise terms exists for the purpose of your discussion. So on the right hand side here, um, this is a term that you know, means, okay, one of the two people who create, contributed DNA to make a new human being, and the person who created a sperm or an egg that ended up becoming a person. Um, and the language, sort of best language that we currently have in commonly used English, it might be genetic parent or birth parent. Although both of those, uh, birth parent especially, implies a particular relationship that actually, um, you know, when we look at cases of things like uh, IVF, that actually the genetic parent and the birth parent are often different people. Um, but the word parent within that, I think is imprecise because it implies a specific kind of relationship between the person who created the genes that made a person and um, their sort of trajectory through life. And so with my students, we actually created new language. And these are a few examples of the words that I created with my groups of students for this term. Uh, one uh, is biological life transmitters or BLTs. We were able to be using that in the classroom. Um, other examples that they came up with include storks or uh, gene givers, they're GGs. Um, but I think it's a really great opportunity also for us as science teachers where we are often like asking our students to learn a huge amount of new vocabulary to point out the places where language is still growing um, to indicate the ways that language does shift uh, based on our understandings of how things work, um, even within science, um, and also giving kids those agency, that agency to really create language that is inclusive in the context that you're working in. So again, this is sort of an overview of the five different aspects of our gender inclusive biology framework. Um, we are just giving you a little bit of a taste. Uh, River will talk later about our website where you can get more information. But again, I wanted to highlight, um, if you would like to read more, um, checking out that tiny URL down in the bottom right hand corner is gonna be really helpful. Um, so a couple of student comments that we've received uh, after doing this work with kiddos. One student, just saying everyone should feel represented in their biology education. Um, and this kid in particular was cisgender, meaning that he did not identify as transgender, but expressed real gratitude in being able to understand the, the ways that other folks experience the world through their particular biology and position. Uh, and then also a student just expressing that gratitude. I've never had a teacher discuss LGBT relationships or even acknowledge that they existed um, and really just emphasizing how important that acknowledgement is. More comments from students. Uh, a student in high school said, in science class, you should teach the difference between gender and sex when kids are young. The student didn't like the fact that they had to learn about this in high school or from their friends. To teachers considering teaching more gender inclusive biology, I would say that this could really mean a lot to your students and there's not really any reason not to do it. Tell us intersex people exist and aren't bad. Now, we know that you are probably getting lots of material and finding more of your own. So viewers to this webinar will be interested in two primary sections. In Teach and Learn Science, in this section, we have many ready-to-go lesson materials, videos, language guides, and scientific research papers. Under Outside the Classroom, we have things like model language for students and staff, policies from different districts, and how to get administrative support. Thank you so much for attending. We'd love to hear comments and questions in the chat or on our website forum if you're viewing us on demand. Once again, we are located at genderinclusivebiology.com and thank you so much for your attention.